This day started cold and blowing here in the nation's capital, and it got worse as it went on. Then just before noon, the official swearing-in ceremony at the White House and the 35 words that officially gave Ronald Reagan the right to be our president for the next four years. Then there was the rush to settle down inside any place warm and join the other 100 million Americans watching the Super Bowl at Stanford on television. The president flipped the coin to get it started. Mr. President, would you please toss the coin? Tales. President Reagan in the White House tossed the coin and uh, the 49ers won the toss. And all I can say is something that used to be a little prayer of mine when I played football myself. May everyone do their best. May there be no injuries. May the best team win and no one have regrets. Unlike Ronald Reagan, the 1984 San Francisco 49ers lacked an accessible personality. This team seemed detached and colorless. The 49ers appeared better suited to a boardroom than a locker room. We developed along the way a business-like approach to the game. And I think we learned along the way to maybe hold back on the emotion, to not show the emotion as much. A lot of people talked about the 1984 team being sort of dispassionate. They were not emotional after a win. That was a team that hated to lose more than they liked to win. To say that team was dispassionate or uh, that we played uh, uh, with not a lot of emotion, I don't agree with that at all. I feel that team played with a lot of emotion and togetherness and uh, because we had great chemistry. Togetherness propelled the 49ers into Super Bowl 19. Their great chemistry was one result of the setbacks they experienced after winning Super Bowl 60. We won a Super Bowl as a very young team in 81. We came back the next year and didn't even make the playoffs. It was a team without focus. It was a team that really didn't regain the spark that they'd had from the year before. After the disappointing uh, 82 season, I think a lot of guys got their heads back together and there was a fair amount of talking among the players that said, we are going to take control of this 83 season. We're not going to repeat what happened last year where we felt we let ourselves down. I just felt that in 1983, we were gaining back the luster from the 1981 season. Then we lost the NFC Championship to Washington. In Washington, the 49ers had to fight back from a 21 to nothing deficit. In the fourth quarter, Joe Montana threw three touchdown passes to tie the score. Montana puts it up in the air. He throws long down the middle, and it is caught! And this is going to be a touchdown! The comeback ultimately fell short. Two controversial penalties enabled Washington to kick the game-winning field goal with 40 seconds left. But an impromptu post-game speech sowed the seeds of a revival. They voted me defensive captain, so I was just compelled to get up and say something. Because I, at first I just got up and I just looked around and, and some guys were crying. We felt cheated. I told everybody to gather around and I said, this hurts. I look around and, and, and we are very angry. And I said, don't forget it. I said, remember this feeling because we don't want to ever feel like that again. Those feelings after that game and the things that were said after that game lasted the whole offseason. That was the longest offseason because we couldn't wait to get back to playing again to make this thing right. Summer brought an early challenge to the team's sense of purpose. Three veterans had jumped to a new pro league. Defensive end Fred Dean and cornerback Ronnie Lott were holdouts. I hope the situations can rectify themselves, but I'm not so sure they can. In Ronnie Lott's case, he was, he was uh, offered an extremely lucrative contract. I just don't know what the problem is, whether it's the agent or what. The contract dispute with Lott, number 42, was quickly resolved. But Fred Dean wouldn't return until the season's 11th week. Despite these examples of discontent, team unity was maintained. The chemistry of that team was phenomenal. And 
even though that there were these things that could have been distractions, they weren't because collectively, as a team, guys kept focused on the job at hand. When you talk about team, one guy does not make a team. I remember us saying, we're going to the Super Bowl this year. We had never, ever said that before or after as a statement in training camp that we were going. And I think that was the type of emotion that carried through the off season for us. And there was a mental engagement to that season unlike any other. And it all had to do with the way that 83 season ended. The 1984 season began in Detroit. There was little to suggest the 49ers would become a juggernaut. In a back and forth battle with the Lions, the lead changed hands four times. Finally, it was left to place kicker Ray Worshing to break a tie game. Four seconds left. It's a 22-yard try. The ball snapped. Base kicked. And it is good. And Worshing has the three points. Up next was a Monday night meeting with the Washington Redskins. This is just like the Super Bowl as far as football is concerned. I don't think anybody's ever going to have a bigger game than this one this time of year. And uh, so you've got to look at it as a big game in your life right now. Emotions from the NFC Championship game were still strong. San Francisco built a 27-3 halftime lead, then held on to exact a measure of revenge. As Montana drops back to pass, he's running out of the right side. He's got some running room over there. If he can't find a receiver, fakes once, runs, drives into the end zone. Touchdown, 49ers! These first two wins had been close and costly to the defense. Injury struck a unit that was still seeking an identity. Cornerbacks Eric Wright and Ronnie Lott were both banged up and missed two games. During the regular season, Lott's aggressive style resulted in five different injuries. He was sidelined for four games. The offense was also stung by injury. Against the Saints, Joe Montana left the game with sore ribs. But back up, Matt Cavanaugh ignited a fourth quarter comeback. Cooper moves out of it, now in motion, going right. Here's Cavanaugh, play action, fake, throws a pass over Mattis, Cooper at the 20. He's got it, breaks a tackle, the 15, the 10, the 5, he's in for a score! One week later, Cavanaugh started in Philadelphia. He threw three touchdown passes. A strong supporting cast helped San Francisco fashion a 4-0 record. The fast start demonstrated that the 1984 49ers were a team in the truest sense of the word. You don't know when your turn will come. You can suddenly be called in to do the most critical thing in the game from out of nowhere. That's why you've got to be ready every week. So there isn't a substitute on the ball club. Everybody plays. Everybody had a role on that team, and Bill made sure if you didn't, you were gone. He wanted you to be able to know that you could be called at any second, and it was a very important part of our winning. Russ Francis didn't immediately embrace the 49ers team concept. As a New England Patriot, the tight end had enjoyed the trappings of stardom and the spotlight. Francis was also a model player. He made the Pro Bowl three times in six seasons. When Francis joined the 49ers in 1982, he wasn't received with open arms. I come back to an 82 season. Bill Walsh talks me into coming out of retirement. There's a strike. There's no football. These guys are grumbling. They're grumpy. They don't like anybody. They don't like me. I'm a new guy on the block. They just won a championship. They want to get on with their lives and play. I didn't feel like I fit in. I probably didn't present myself very well to the team. Bob McKittrick, the line coach, walked by me on one of the first practices. I had my helmet on the ground, I was sitting on it. And he said, listen, 
He said, we're the world champion San Francisco 49ers. We don't sit on our helmets. I said, okay, coach. So I got up and put my helmet on. He said, we're the world champion San Francisco 49ers. You buckle that helmet on. He was a former Marine, I found out. You strap on that helmet when you're on this field. Okay, coach, whatever you say. We would be in camp, and Russ Francis, uh, we called him Flipper because he spent a lot of time in the pool because he was hurt. Uh, he had this bother him or that bother him. Got kicked in the leg and it pulled the muscle in. It was kind of a, a loner, I'll do my own kind of thing, and you're going to have to get used to that. I think that the majority of people thinking that I might have been a free spirit or I might have been eccentric or I might have been self-centered is really um, based on the fact that I didn't show a lot of what I was thinking or doing. People thought because I went flying or jumped out of airplanes or rode motorcycles or surfed that I wasn't paying attention to the job at hand, which is football. But you don't play 14 years in the National Football League unless you eat, sleep, and breathe football. And I would always think about scenarios and situations coming up in the field while I was on a surfboard or whether I was flying on a, in a plane or jumping out of a plane, believe it or not, in free fall at 120 miles an hour, you have enough time to run a pass pattern, break across the middle, get behind the strong safety, open your parachute, make sure it's opening, and then think about catching it for the touchdown. Despite his bumpy landing in San Francisco, this former outsider had become a respected teammate by 1984. The camaraderie that Francis valued was encouraged by a restaurant owner's preseason offer. We had a guy, Tim was his first name, he had a restaurant It was just up the hill from our facility in Redwood City. Tim came to the team and said, listen guys, for every game you win, you guys come up here, you have a free burger, free milkshake, soda, whatever, it's on me. The whole team. And it meant so much to the team that he did that. The, the highlight of the week after winning a game was going up to Tim's place up the hill for that burger. He didn't know we were going to win every game but one, and it brought the team together. And it was simple, and it was basic, but it was powerful. The 49ers allowed just 227 points during the regular season, fewest in the NFL. The league's least scored upon defense was also the least publicized. Teams tend to get remembered for their play and their personality. And I think our defense didn't have a personality that people could focus in on. We always seemed to run into a team that had a sexier story about them that everybody could relate to. We didn't have anything like that. 50-year pro, Keena Turner, number 58, was the only 49er to play every defensive down. Turner was a perfectionist. He was often unsparing in his self-criticism. It got to a point where it wasn't ever good enough the way you play personally because you were always thinking about the, the tackle you missed or the play that, that, that you didn't make. I could be up at 3 in the morning waxing my car after a game because I missed the tackle. I think it went back to just that relentless look for some perfection in the way that you played. And yes, the, the downside of searching for perfection is you never ever get there. Turner's search didn't really begin until 1981. That's when Jack Hacksaw Reynolds, number 64, joined the team. The veteran linebacker was eccentric but totally committed to football. Turner was impressed. As a young player coming in, I didn't realize that being a good athlete had nothing to do with being a good football player. And I just learned how to be a football player around Hack. His approach to the game was one of being a student throughout. He came to every meeting with a shoebox full of pencils. He had a divider down the middle. He had sharpened pencils on one side, dull pencils on the other and he just kept changing them as he wrote down every single thing that was said in the meeting uh, and that was a demeaning approach that I didn't know and wasn't used to and didn't think that that had anything to do with being a football player and I learned that from Jack. Big splits over here. He ran the nose over on here. I was over here I think. You'd come to you know morning breakfast the day of a game and Jack would be sitting you know down at the breakfast table at eight in the morning 
fully dressed with his uniform on, helmet and everything. I mean, he'd already have grass and mud in his, in his face mask. He said to me one morning, because I looked at him and said, he's made too many times, he said to me, hey, I'm ready to play. Are you ready? Reynolds imparted his veteran wisdom to a resourceful and disciplined defense. But this unit didn't receive enough credit for its toughness. Everyone thought that we were a finesse type defense. But we had a defense that could hit you and beat you up. We had guys that would come up and knock the crap out of you. All four starting defensive backs. Carlton Williamson, number 27, Dwight Hicks, Eric Wright, and Ronnie Lott, number 42, were named to the Pro Bowl. These celebrated starters were supported by unsung reserves, like Dana McLemore, number 43. Each week, it was someone else coming out with big plays. And that's because we played the team concept and team defense better than any team that ever played in NFL history. Number 22, Dwight Hicks, was an inspirational leader. In 1984, he earned Pro Bowl honors for the fourth straight season. Hicks was signed as a free agent in 1979. He had already been cut by two NFL teams. He was working a day job in Detroit when the 49ers contacted him. They had gone through 33 defensive backs that year, and I came in for a workout and they liked me, but they didn't want to sign me. And then there was a call saying, uh, Dwight, this is uh, John McVay from the San Francisco 49ers. There's a ticket for you at Detroit Metro. And I can remember calling the airport trying to find out if it was a one-way or two-way ticket. And it actually was a one-way ticket, and, and I signed with them. John Facinda did a story about me, and uh, he was saying that I was managing a health food store. Three years ago, Hicks was managing a health food store. In 1981, he managed the league's most exciting secondary. No, sir. I was working as a stock boy in a health food store. I signed with them with eight games remaining, and uh, they had won one game. In our last home game in 1979, when we played the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they needed one game to get into the playoffs, and they had two left. We beat them. The fans tore down the goalposts, and I said to myself, could you imagine if we actually bought a team here? You know, what these fans would be like? I mean, that was the second win of the season, and they were tearing down the goalposts like we had just won a championship. A world championship in 1981 unleashed 49er fever. In 1984, that fever reached epidemic proportions after the team's 6-0 start. From Candlestick Park to Castro Street, a diverse fan base had plenty to sing about. The San Francisco 49ers meant so much to the city. People were trying to market the success that we were having on the football field. And somebody came up with an idea of let's cut a record. And 14 guys from the team recorded a song called We're the 49ers. You till we win the fight. You know, you're not gonna know I'm not gonna say. <laughs> the record was actually released around the week of the Pittsburgh game. And so Bill was very unhappy with us that so much focus was on this outside of football thing. That week, the undefeated 49ers finally fell to earth. They were knocked off balance by the three and three Steelers. 
Despite numerous miscues, the 49ers held a 17 to 10 fourth quarter lead. Late in the game, they mounted an apparently successful goal line stand, but a questionable penalty nullified a fourth and goal stop. They threw a pass to, to uh, Stallworth. Eric Wright was guarding. I thought he made one of the best defensive plays I've ever seen. And the official on the play called incomplete. And another official from, it seemed like he was a back judge, threw the flag. The infraction enabled Pittsburgh to score a touchdown. Moments later, the Steelers kicked the game-winning field goal. The 49ers suffered their only defeat of the season. We say that officials can lose it for you. They did. But that's part of the game. They're inept idiots. But that is part of life, whether you're driving down the street or in the military or working somewhere or making love or whatever the hell it is. There are some things that happen out of your control and you have to account for them and overcome them. Well, we almost overcame it. We almost overcame it after all the things that went wrong. So you guys got a lot left in you. After the loss, Bill Walsh wanted the 49ers to add some fire to their business-like composure. We have to be angry going on the, on the field the next time we play. We have to be so upset and angry that we take it out on the next team. Against winless Houston, the 49ers were slow to burn. In a surprisingly tight game, San Francisco didn't secure a victory until there were nine minutes left to play. Here's Montana going back to pass. He's going to throw the ball deep down the field to Clark. And he called it. Still goes. 35, 30, 25, 20. Clark got it down to five. He goes into the end zone for a 49er touchdown. It was Edward DeBartolo Jr. who got angry. The 49ers owner was furious about his team's listless performance. Afterwards, uh, Bill was giving his summation of the game what we did wrong, what we need to build upon. By the time Eddie got down to the locker room, he comes in and I, I believe he interrupted Bill because he was pissed. And he felt that we played well below the standards of what we were accustomed to play. And he let us know. And I, I think Eddie's quote was, you guys, that was an awful performance. You gotta bring ass to get ass. Eddie was a very passionate person and very volatile. He would come in and let his presence be known sometimes and um, was quite effective. <laughs> well, I'm trying to build a competitive playoff contender. I'm trying to build a winner. And I also, the main thing is, I don't like to lose. That's it. Because we had that much success early, each week after that, there's an added pressure to win, and not only to win, but uh, win big. Winning was expected, <laughs> you know, and obviously through Bill's approach, through our ownership's approach, it, it became something that was demanded. We knew that if we didn't win a Super Bowl, that we didn't have a successful year. So in that respect, there was a lot of pressure. I didn't feel a lot of the pressure that maybe some of the players might have felt I do know one man on that team that felt it every single second of every single day and night, and that was Bill Walsh. Somebody quoted Bill as saying, and he believed in creative tension. There was a great deal of tension that Bill liked to create. I don't know that it was so much creative. It was very direct. It was very in your face. Wait a minute, just, just wait a second. The halfback crosses that way on a double circle out? Well, let me, let me pull back goes to the flat. I put the play in, Paul. If you correct me on the field, I put the thing in upstairs. Now I'm being told by you what the to do. Let's go. He didn't like the fact that I flew airplanes or rode motorcycles or jumped out of planes for that matter. When he found out about trying to break a world speed record, which I was working on seriously, he came to me and said, you can't do this. The season started. If you get hurt, 
you know, you could be lost for the season. I said, Coach, at 500 miles an hour, 20 feet above the ground, if there's a problem, you'd be lucky to find my watch. And I knew that I'd done wrong. I had not informed him, and I wasn't being the team player that he wanted me to be. So I scrubbed that test flight. I had to learn how to play football the way that Bill Walsh was coaching football, and that was one inch at a time, go out and do what you're supposed to do. I don't want to hear about, I could have gotten deep, I could have beat this guy. If Russ gets four yards, the play worked. So we don't need any kind of fancy moves by the tight end. Four yard gain, you get that out of the play, it worked. Play off, Dwight, yeah. Read, read what you see. His approach was artful and creative. Football was an art to him. Pretty, pretty. I mean, that will be a beauty. Football. It wasn't just this entanglement of bodies that physically, play after play, proved who was the stronger man, who was the better man. Bill's approach was who was the smarter man. And it was all about outthinking the other team, out adjusting making a quick decision on the field that's going to beat their thought process. It's going to be a step ahead of them. During the second half of the regular season, San Francisco outthought and overwhelmed the opposition. the final eight games, the team's average margin of victory was nearly 23 points. 1984, the 49ers led the NFC in total offense and scoring. They ended the regular season with an NFL record 15 wins. Bill Walsh had designed a team that operated so efficiently it seemed to have rolled off an assembly line. A precision machine, that was sort of our label. Without a heck of a lot of personality, a machine that just effectively and precisely destroyed the opponent. In the NFC playoffs, Joe Montana threw two touchdown passes during the game's opening seven minutes. Hold the man is first for a touchdown for the 49ers. The defense recorded six sacks and three takeaways. The Giants' offense never crossed the goal line. The win meant San Francisco would host Chicago in the NFC title game. Bill Walsh's dislike of the Bears was exceeded only by his distrust of the local media. Critical area. If we feel he's on the Walsh's contempt for Bay Area sports writers fueled an us against them mindset. The newspaper men, they want you to lose. They want you to lose so bad. The local guys pick you lose every weekend. Just come on. Make me look good. You know? You, you see it. They want you to lose. And the people that are patting you on the back, they got nothing to lose. They pat you on the back, you're doing great. When you lose, you're jerks. Everybody wants your ass. They want your high. That's how, that's how you have to take the field. No one is on our side, I'm telling you. Even though they'll, they'll slide a drink down you in the bar, no one's on your side. He used the press to solidify the team as one and together. It was another way of saying, okay, we've got to surround the, the wagons again. We've got to surround the cells because they're here they come again. Keep clear of the public, keep clear of the media, and let's just turn to ourselves. Security has become tighter here at the 49er training camp in Redwood City. Few people do show up now to try to get a glimpse of the team through that fence. Some star players avoid direct access to the public. Isn't that easy for the media to talk to them either? Are the 49ers uptight this week? If anything, this is the most nerve-wracking game of the year, and maybe, just maybe, they are too tense about it. Chicago's vaunted 46 defense had totaled an NFL record 72 sacks. But Walsh was hardly too tense about playing the Bears. I think he can knock their hands off. The more I think about it, they're setting themselves up as a football team. These guys are 
And any time a guy thinks he's rough and tough and comes from any town, four out of five of those guys get their ass to kick. Because most of those kind of guys are dumb. In the NFC Championship game, the most dominant defense on the field belonged to the 49ers. Side, looking toward the end zone, now throwing, fires, it's caught by Solomon! Touchdown for the 49ers! Walsh turned rookie guard Guy McIntyre, number 62, into a 280-pound blocking bag. A shutout victory guaranteed the 49ers a date with the Dolphins in Super Bowl 19. We felt that uh, we should have been in it last year also, and uh, came down a couple calls at the end of the game and uh, just wanted to get back and prove that uh, we are a good football team. Joe Montana cast a giant shadow throughout 1984. He was the NFC's top-rated quarterback. In the 18 games leading up to the Super Bowl, Montana threw 32 touchdown passes. Montana was the 49ers' most visible player, as well as their most valuable one. But in 1984, there was a new gunslinger in town. The Dolphins' Dan Marino threw a record-shattering 48 touchdown passes during the regular season. Miami finished with a 16-2 record. The Dolphins led the league in scoring. During the build-up to Super Bowl XIX, the supremely gifted Marino was the media's darling. This was true even when Joe Montana was the focus of attention. The biggest crowd of reporters was around Joe Montana. The question there, is Montana in any way jealous of Dolphin quarterback Dan Marino? The answer was no. Everybody has their time, and you know, this is his right now. He's had a great year, so he didn't expect anything less from it. And uh, well, I think it's great what's happening to him. The media had generated a quarterback controversy. Any slight against Montana was taken as a slight against the entire team. The press fueled the fire. They gave us some added incentive to win. They were primarily focused on Dan Marino. They were trying to say their offense was so much uh, better than ours. Instead of an old-fashioned pep talk, Bill Walsh used sarcasm as a motivational tool. I can remember Walsh lying down in the middle of the floor, and he just started rumbling on and on about Miami. Oh, they have such a great offense. Oh, my God. How are we going to stop them? And geez, their defense and the killer bees, geez, how are we going to be able to get a first down or even a yard? And he just wanted to light that fire before we came out of the locker room. And I can remember he turned and he looked at me and he just said, God, don't you just want to break the wall and just go kick their ass right now? <laughs> San Francisco's second drive of the first quarter, Joe Montana threw a 33-yard scoring pass to Carl Monroe. He's in the end zone for a touchdown for the 49ers! Fantastic. You know, they talk about Marino having a great arm, and I'll tell you, nobody could have thrown that ball any harder and on target than Montana did that to him. Marino immediately retaliated. Miami regained the lead to end the first quarter. But from that point on, Super Bowl 19 belonged to Joe Montana. Stop During the second quarter, Montana directed three successive touchdown drives. Roger Craig taking the pass from Joe Montana. Good for the score, and the Niners are back on top. Get it in! 
Cross back, short drop, fakes once. He's going to run it himself. He's into the end zone. Touchdown. All eyes are now fixed on pro football's best quarterback. A handoff given to Craig. Craig Patters is way to the goal line. He goes in for a 49er touchdown. And the 49ers are leaving the Miami Dolphins far to the rear now. The defense began to pressure Marino during the second period. We rushed him, and that was the first time you had seen him get rushed in the pocket. And so Danny was getting frustrated with the pressure, with, with people flashing in his face, getting bumped around. It was something that hadn't happened all season. They were hitting his ass. And you start doing that to a quarterback in the NFL, I don't care who you are. It'll make you look very ordinary. The league's best protected quarterback during the regular season was sacked four times. He was also intercepted twice. From the 28-yard line, Marino drops back to throw a pass. He fires to the goal line, and it is intercepted. Picked off by Eric Wright. Bill Walsh had choreographed a dominating victory. Going back to pass on third and 10, Montana. Looks over the left side. Caught by Craig on the way to the end zone. And Craig goes in for the score. Came to see an offense and the wrong one showed up. Joe Montana was named Super Bowl MVP. The 49ers won easily to finish the season with an NFL record 18 victories. DP, how you like that, huh? How you like that? Pretty good, huh? Woo-hoo! Oh, he kicked their ass. Kick their ass! They can go back to Miami <laughs> and go and fish. And go fish. <laughs> Nobody knew what kind of offense we had. It was their offense. Right? Nobody knew Our offense showed them, okay? And then, how in the hell were we going to stop Duper Clay Marina? <laughs> Nobody knew but us. Right? All right. All right. On their back. Game ball. Coach Bill Walsh. Yeah. Walsh had a game plan that was beautiful. And he had one of the greatest quarterbacks that ever played a game uh, to orchestrate it. All we heard all week long was Miami's offense. How are you going to stop them? And I think deep inside of us, nothing was said, but inside of each of us, uh, we just knew that we had an offense too, and no one was thinking about having to stop us, so I think we were out to prove something. I just can't say enough about the resourcefulness of all 49 players, because all of them contributed. All 49 guys got to play in that game. And it was players like Carl Monroe, Mario Clark, Jeff Fuller that weren't starters but came in and contributed a lot to the success of that game. They all contributed a big part to our success all year and the Super Bowl was just a culmination of all of it. And a complete team game and a team win. Coach Walsh, there ought to be a bigger word than congratulations for all that we saw tonight and what you and that team of yours have accomplished. Well, I tell you, they've given it all year, Mr. President. This is the greatest football team, the greatest group of people I've ever been around, and I hope we've added to today's festivities. For me, at the end of 84, it was like, see, I told you. I told you so. This is what I told you this team was. This is what I told you we should have accomplished after 83. This is what we said we would do. It was a season that I'll never forget. Throughout 1984, the San Francisco 49ers proved that America's game was a team game. Other people have some strengths, and we've got 49 guys. Remind ourselves that every play is a critical one, and they were all involved, 49 guys. The true character of that team was that they would have done anything for each other to win, to finish what they said they were gonna do at the beginning of the season. It was that bond, it was that closest, and we still have it today. In my mind, not just because I played there, but you look at all the facts, that was one of the greatest football teams to ever take the field, bar none. More than anything, we played for each other. That team 
had so much chemistry. We were a very confident group of players and believed in each other. And I feel that's why we were so successful. And that's why I wear this ring. I was defensive captain of that team. Best team I ever been associated with. This is what you play for every year, and uh, the only bad part about it is uh, when you don't make it, now you're expected to make it every year. And uh, we expect it of ourselves, and anything less than this is, is a letdown for us. The expectations became even higher after this history-making season ended. Two Lombardi trophies were not enough. Looking back and, and appreciating those times gone by are much easier now. But when it was going on, there was always a game next week that you had to prepare for. So if you enjoyed it for a moment, you had to come back to the reality that, okay, I got to play next week and I got to play next season. And what we did last week or the season before doesn't matter.